Um, so that was a little bit awkward. I, um, I just set myself up at my favourite table here in um, Belmont overlooking the water and an old bloke kind of hobbled over to me. He was holding his knee the whole way, the poor dude. He obviously has a sore knee and he asked if he could sit at the table with me. <laughs> and I, um, every part of me wanted to say yes because I wouldn't mind sitting with him and chatting to him if I, um, if I had to. But I had to tell him that I've just set up my camera. I'm just about to... Um, to take a video and he said that's okay mate I'll continue down I think I could make it <laughs> I was like oh no I'm the worst human in the world I should just let him sit here I did offer to move and then he said it was uh, that was okay he was gonna move on he's just down there I might go say hi to him after I finish the video and buy him a coffee or something um, welcome welcome back to another video I, I don't know if I got any extra subscribers after pointing and asking you to subscribe last week but, um, but it was good doing it anyway. And now get this, you remember last week I told you I was doing something in the video that I had never done in a video before? The thing that I thought I was doing that I'd never done before was wearing my hat forwards, um, right? But then I looked back through my past videos and I had worn my hat forwards before. <laughs> so I actually wasn't at that point doing anything new, apart from the thing that a few of you mentioned, which was um, asking you to subscribe and doing all that youtube -y kind of stuff. So. I'm willing to pay that. Whoever wrote that in the comments, you're welcome to come up and get something from me because that was technically the new thing I was doing. Um, whilst I thought it was that my hat was forward. We are in John chapter 5. Now this week, instead of, um, you know, kind of giving you a broad overview of what's happening and talking about it, I thought what I'd do is just read every single verse in the passage and stop and make comments um, when it seems appropriate, when there's something to draw your attention to. Um, this story is entitled The Healing at the Pool and it starts in John chapter 5 verse 1. If you have your Bible, open it up, you can have a look, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Here we go. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. So you've got to get this picture in your head. Um, Jesus is not here locked in some kind of back room. He's... Uh, he's not quietly away in some kind of corner where no one will see him. It is like religious festival time. So there's heaps of people around. And the place where this miracle is going to take place is basically in, inside like a covered pool. So imagine, you know, going to, what's the closest covered pool to here? I don't know, going to, going to Lambton Pool or something in that kid's pool. And you've got like the, the posts up and, and it's shady and, and people are kind of sitting there. And there are people absolutely everywhere at this pool. It's near the temple. There's religious people. There's, it's just a completely public place where everyone can see what's going to happen. Read on. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, what's happening in this verse is John is trying to paint the picture for you. Uh, Jesus comes to this pool and there's a whole bunch of disabled people there, um, people with disabilities. There's the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, I think he very, very deliberately uh, speaks about these particular ailments. Um, now, there's probably a whole bunch of other people there too, people with skin diseases, um, yeah, people who couldn't hear, all these kind of things. But I think he points these ones out for this reason. He points them out so that, uh, he points out the ones, sorry, that are the most obvious. Um, they're, they're the most obvious ones to the eye, so you can see them. Um, you can see when people are blind, you can, you can see um, when people's limbs are shriveled, you can see, or they're missing limbs, or you can see when they're unable to walk. And it's not easy to fake a miracle, right? If someone has no arm and then all of a sudden they have an arm, that's not easy to fake. Um, if someone's blind, hasn't been out to sea for ages, and then they can see all of a sudden, it's not easy to, to fake. Um, so, John is telling us that this is a genuine miracle. This is something that's like extraordinary that's happening here in this moment. Um, but also, I think this raises a theological question that I'm actually going to kind of leave with you now. Um, he says there was a great number of people there. A great number of people who are in need. In a moment we're going to hear that the person uh, who Jesus sees and learns has been um, lame for 38 years. He's been unable to walk for 38 years. Now, there's probably a whole bunch of people there who have been unable to walk for 38 years. There's a whole bunch of blind people there who have been unable to see. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people who have had traumatic accidents. There's a whole bunch of people who are on the outside of their society. And yet, 
we only hear of one miracle. Uh, it's not like Jesus came there, you know, and he, and he just goes, Everybody here, you are healed. Just get up and walk. Um, why is that? Did Jesus not care for the others that were there? Why is it just this one? Now, what you'll notice is... A lot of people answer this question, and all the rest of them probably didn't have faith. This guy doesn't have faith either. He's got no idea what's going on. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. And when Jesus says, do you want to get well? He says, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred while I'm trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me. He's got no, he's got no faith. He doesn't know who Jesus is. He's got no, he didn't even tell he's got faith in God or anything. He's just sitting there hoping to get well. Uh, so faith isn't the solution here. So what is it? Why? Why just this one? That's a question I'm going to leave you with. Now, I've got my own answer to that question, um, but I'm not going to give it to you. Because I want you to think about it. I want you to wrestle with it. What does it mean? Um, maybe you can invite me to your class and we can talk about it in more detail later. Or just ask your teacher, see what they think it means. Um, so all these people are lying around the pool. Um... And we learn that Jesus finds out that this man has been uh, in with his condition, living with his condition for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, uh, and he learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? And this is the response of the man. Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We actually start to see why all these people with needs are gathering around this pool. Um, now, when you read other ancient sources from the time, we also hear about this pool. Now, there was a genuine belief at this time that when the water stirred, so every now and then the water would stir, it would start to bubble up, it'd be, there'd be something happening in the water. And there was a belief at the time that when that happened, that was an angel. That an angel was coming down and stirring the water. And when the water was stirred, if you were the first person to get into the pool, you would be miraculously healed of whatever it is that ailed you. Uh, you'd be healed and you'd be able to go on with your regular life, being a fully functioning member of the community. Uh, uh, that was the kind of belief. So that's why this man is sitting here. But we learned something about this man. He says, I have no one. Uh, the picture is uh, uh, everyone else there. Uh, they're all clamoring. They're all trying to get into the pool first. Everyone else has someone to help them. But not this man. He is um, he's there all by himself and he's been trying. It seems like he's been trying for years and years and years. And suddenly Jesus comes up to him and he says, Do you want to get well? <laughs> this is the moment. Do you want to get well? My friend, he is saying, Your dreams have come true. Do you want to get well? But would you, do you notice? Uh, this man doesn't even presume that he could ask Jesus. He's in a situation where it's like he doesn't even feel like he can ask. Whether Jesus could help him to the pool, he doesn't ask for anything. He doesn't ask for a miracle. He doesn't ask for healing. He's just telling this man his situation. He's just explaining exactly how things are for him. He says, I'm lonely. I'm sick and I'm lonely. I don't even know what to do anymore. It's like he's just thrown his hands up. Have you ever had that feeling? <laughs> that feeling like you've come to the end of your tether, like you don't know what to do anymore. Like you don't know where to go anymore. Like there's no one who is there to help you. And you don't even feel like you've got anyone to ask to help you. It's in that moment that Jesus, Jesus comes up to this man and he says, Do you want to become well? And I think, my friends, that question is going out to all of us here in all times, in all places. Whenever you feel alone, whenever you feel afraid, I think Jesus comes to you and he says, Do you want to be well? And the healing that he gives you may not be physically physical healing, but it would be a healing of spirit and soul and mind, a healing that shows you that things are okay in the world even when they don't seem to be. Are you with me? Jesus says, do you want to get well? And uh, the man um, says, sir, I've no one to take me into the water. The story continues. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. Healing, restoration, newness comes to this man with just a couple of words. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But then the story takes a dramatic turn. Um, it's all marvelous, all wonderful up until that point, and it turns. We hear this. The only thing this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It's a Sabbath! The law forbids that you carry your mat! 
Can you believe it? <laughs> the religious leaders, they see this man who once was unable to walk, walking. They witness a miracle and then all they can think about is the law. All they can think about is the rules. <laughs> That's all they can think about. They just think about, this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not how it's done. We don't care that you're healed. I think it's something, something interesting. Sometimes I, I think our, our commitment to the rules, our love for the law, blinds us to what God is doing in the world. <laughs> Sometimes we're so strict. Um, we're so forceful. We're so religious that we're unable to celebrate the movement of God. Um, Jesus says this later. He says when, when he's speaking to these, these Pharisees and the teachers of the law, um, Jewish leaders, he says this. He says, my father is always working to this very day and I too am working. <laughs> what is Jesus saying? There's no rest for healing. There's no rest for goodness. There is no time where you should lay aside your commitment to bring grace and peace and love to people. He says, God's been doing that forever. <laughs> Even in his rest, his seventh day of rest, he has always been working for grace and peace and love and joy and goodness. Uh, the man replied, the man who made me well told me to pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is the fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, it seems as if Jesus is miracle and then kind of just disappears. Why is that? Did he not want people to know? Why is it that he does this miracle and just appears? I want you to think about that question just for a moment. Now the story ends. Later Jesus found him, it's the man who he just healed, at the temple. Which is an amazing sentence as well, isn't it? Um, this man wouldn't have been able to go into the temple. He just had to stay on the outside, on the outskirts. Um, and now we find him in the temple. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, he's back with his community. He's back with his family. He's taking part in the everyday life of the Jewish people. He found him in the temple and he says this, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now that is an interesting sentence, a thing to say to this man. <laughs> Jesus says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, immediately when you hear that, um, uh, you begin to think, if you're anything like me, you think, what? hang on a second, like, what's he saying? If he continues sinning, he's gonna be punished? Like, like, like anyone who has any kind of sickness is like a punishment from God? Because that would be a terrifying thing. If like our sin meant that we were immediately punished with some kind of physical ailment. Now. I think if you read the whole of John's Gospel, if you flip over a couple of chapters to John chapter 9, what you'll see is this. Jesus emphatically denies that uh, people who were born blind were born blind because they sinned or their parents sinned. That's in John chapter 9. He emphatically denies the connection between sinning and sickness. He's saying that's not the way it works. That's not the way this works. You're not being punished because of your sin when you're sick. So what is he saying here? I think it all goes back all the way to Jesus' question when he says, do you want to get well? Now, he doesn't, he doesn't say there, do you want to walk? He says, do you want to get well? Or, do you want to be made whole? Might be another translation. Uh, what's Jesus saying? He's saying to be whole is not just to be able to walk. <laughs> to be whole is not just to be physically fit. To be whole is to rid your life of sin and brokenness and evil so you can live for goodness and for God. What's he saying? Your life will never be whole whilst you're addicted to or committed to sinfulness. Now, it seems like a strange thing to say until you begin to think about it, right? 
What he's saying is sin is the thing that destroys your life. Now we think of sin as just like an arbitrary bunch of rules that God has set, set out um, in the world for us to follow. Like, you know, like this harsh God he wants you to follow these commands or he'll punish you. But maybe actually what we need to begin to think of sin as is all those things that destroy your life and the life of the world and the people around you. That's what sin is, right? Let's think about it like this. Let's pick some, some, some sins. How many lives have been destroyed by the abusive use of, use of sex, for example? It seems like every other day I hear of someone whose life has been destroyed because someone has forced them to do something they don't want to do, because someone's manipulated them, because someone's taken advantage of them. Lives are completely destroyed by that. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Stop sinning or your whole life will fall down. That's what Jesus is saying. What about the misuse of alcohol? The overconsumption of alcohol? How many lives have been destroyed by drinking? How many people have been abused by people who just continually get drunk? How many accidents have happened in cars? How many people's lives have been taken away in tragic uh, traffic accidents? How many lives have been destroyed by lies, making stuff up about people? Yeah. Now you can kind of see what Jesus is saying, right? He's saying a whole life is one that is free from sin. So many things in this verse. Um, I've gone on for way too long. We'll leave it there. Have a chat in your groups. Um, invite me and I'll talk to you more about it.